All right, so welcome guests and friends and Mr. Sandifer. The, uh, I'm Jack DeCastro, president of the Dartmouth Libertarians, and it is my distinct privilege to welcome Timothy Sandifer to campus to talk to all of us a little bit, share with us a little bit about his most recent book, Freedom's Furies, how Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, and Ayn, and Ayn Rand found liberty in an age of darkness. A little bit of background on Mr. Sandifer, He's an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and vice president for litigation at the Goldwater Institute. Um, and just a little anecdote about how this event got started, I read an excellent piece um, by him that I recommend all of you uh, on video and in this room to read on the relationship between Isabel Patterson and Ayn Rand, which was acrimonious and complicated to say the least, um, on the Objective Standard Institute's website. Um, and perhaps uh, Mr. Sanford can remind us of the title of that article because I am blanking on it right now. But without further ado, I'm going to shut up and welcome Mr. Sanford to present. Thank you very much. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, and I, I'm glad to be back. I, it's, uh, last time I spoke to the Dartmouth Libertarians was 13 years ago, so you all were probably in junior high school back then. but. Uh, um, yes, I, so I have an, actually an entire book about uh, the, the friendship between Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, and Ayn Rand, and how these three women basically started the libertarian movement in the United States in 1943, when all three of them published books advocating free markets and individual liberty. And uh, they, this is a, is a well-known anecdote in the history of libertarian thought. But I've always been intrigued by what the what the, the backstory is. Why? How is it that, that it can't just be coincidence that all three of them published books in the same year? And in fact, it turns out that they all knew each other. They were friends and and colleagues. And that, as was mentioned, they had their their falling outs. Being good libertarians, they had to argue over principles and and so forth. Um, and they were just mar fascinating personalities. Brilliant women. And really, in, in many respects, uh, pioneering feminist figures. And that's a, a, a part of the story that gets ignored today when we're supposed to believe that, that all true feminists are on the left. So these, these women, uh, let me start with, with their biographies, and then we'll talk about their influences and, and what it was, what were the big influences that caused the fact that in 1943 they published their books that was uh, Isabel Patterson's The God of the Machine, Rose Wilder Lane's The Discovery of Freedom, and Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. What were the causes that, that led to this sort of uh, uh, annus mirabilis, as they say? So Isabel Patterson was born in 1886 in a, on a tiny island in Canada on the northern side of Lake Huron and to a, in a very poor family. Her father was an alcoholic. Her, her mother was a, a put-upon uh, housewife on the frontier. And she grew up in dirt poor on the western frontier, moving from um, uh, the Northwest Territories of Canada into Utah and Montana, and that's where her childhood was spent. She later remembered that she was 16 years old before she saw her first light bulb, and that she was so afraid to touch it that she left it on all night long. Patterson, uh, we don't know too much about her, her early life. She moved, we know that when she went to California, she lived in San Francisco for a while during World War I. She was horrified by World War I so much that she later claimed that she came close to having a nervous breakdown at, at, at what was going on in the world. We know that in 1912, she, as a reporter, she set a world altitude record in a, in a rickety experimental airplane, 5,300 feet, uh, which was the, the, the world record for a passenger in an airplane at that time. And by 1920, she was working for the sculptor Gutzon Borglum, who is best remembered today for carving Mount Rushmore. She, she was his secretary. And she worked for him for a couple years while he was making the sculpture on the side of um, of Stone Mountain in Georgia that he had been commissioned to build this monument to the Confederate generals. He never completed that project because the constant bickering and political fighting about the project irritated him so much that finally one day he shattered the plaster miniatures of his sculptures and threw them from the top of the mountain and quit the project. And the, in fact, the, the, the Stone Mountain Memorial Association swore out a warrant against him and tried to have him arrested for destroying what they claimed was, his, was their property. Uh, so the project was completed by a different artist. 
And Patterson loved that story. She loved that, that sort of person. She, she spent all her life, she said, I grew up in a time when men were men. She really loved the idea of these big, bold characters who would take principled stands for things. And, and she thought later in life that that spirit was gone from America. In, by, in 1924, she got a job on the New York Herald Tribune, writing a weekly column for a brand new um, weekly books supplement that the newspaper published. Her column was called Turns with a Bookworm. And so every week for the following 25 years, she published this, this article, which, this column, which was a gossip column about the publishing industry. It wasn't book reviews primarily, although she included some of those. And she also wrote tons of articles and book reviews and things on the side. But her column was primarily just her random thoughts and her experiences meeting famous authors and what she thought about new books and what new books were coming out and that sort of stuff. And it became her, her major uh, bullhorn through which to project her political and economic views in the years to come. Rose Wilder Lane was also born in 1886, and she's best remembered today, if at all, as the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who wrote the Little House on the Prairie novels. Uh, actually, Rose helped write those. She was the secret co-author of those books with her mother. Um, and of course, those books are very famous for their romantic depiction of life on the American frontier, but the reality is that Rose hated the frontier. She hated it. She hated it. She hated it so much that the instant she was able to, she left. She learned how to use, she learned Morse code, got a job as a telegraph operator, moved to the city, and when that wasn't good enough, moved to California, and when that wasn't far enough away, moved to Albania to get away from the American frontier. She hated it so much. She wanted to be a reporter and a journalist, and uh, she, brief, she was married very briefly in San Francisco uh, to a man named Gillette Lane. That's where her, her, her married name comes from. And they worked for a while together as uh, kind of small town hustlers doing all sorts of stuff, uh, uh, primarily real estate sales, which is obviously a huge thing in 1920s California. Um, but they eventually divorced, and Rose decided that she wanted to travel to Europe as a reporter, in part because she wanted to see the brand new Soviet Union, because Rose called herself a communist. She had grown up, converted to socialism by Eugene Debs's The Appeal to Reason as a child, and she was really, she was, she later said that she was basically, she had never joined the party, she said, but she was very, she basically was a communist. What she saw in Europe scared that out of her. She uh, happened to be in Europe when the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was proclaimed. She traveled to um, Azerbaijan and, I'm sorry, not Azerbaijan, uh, Albania and uh, Armenia. She went to Albania, Armenia, and Georgia, and she witnessed the, the confiscation of grain and the nationalization that was going on, the starvation of the peasantry, the compelled labor that was going on in the new Soviet Union. And it horrified her, what she saw. And she returned to the United States in 1928 and sort of dived into, a, the, uh, she was, both she and Patterson were basis, basically self-educated. Patterson had only two years of schooling. And Rose had a little bit more, but not that much more. So she was, Rose decided to dive into learning about economics and politics and political philosophy. By that time, she had already written a couple books, including a biography of Jack London which she wrote as a series of magazine articles intending to turn it into a book until Jack London's widow objected to that, got upset with that because uh, Lane had kind of romanticized some aspects of London's life. And so Lane decided to change the name from London to a made-up name and turn it into a novel and published it that way. It was called He Was a Man. And that was how I think Lane and Patterson learned of each other. The first mention of Lane in Patterson's column is about this book, and, and it arrived in 1924. But they started corresponding. And from that point until uh, their, their final breakup sometime in the 1940s, they corresponded and eventually you know, met in person probably in the early 1930s, although we, know, we don't know for sure, uh, and spent long evenings together listening to the radio in each other's homes, listening to the news and talking about politics and philosophy and books like that. Now, Rand, of course, she was a generation younger than these other two. She was 20 years younger than both of them. 
And she was born in Russia, what soon be after her, uh, and during her childhood became the Soviet Union. So she wasn't on the scene at the time when the first of the major transformations, the first big influence on the lives of Patterson and Lane, the, the first of the two big reasons why they did what they did in 1943 happened, and that was what is called the revolt from the village. So the revolt from the village was this literary movement that began in about 1920. There are precursors to it, but really the, 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 it finally exploded in 1920. And it, it, the, what happened, the reason for this, what's called the revolt from the village was the 1920 census revealed for the first time that more Americans lived off the farm than on the farm. And there were these drastic new technologies, right? Radio and the automobile, especially, had, were starting to really revolutionize how people live their lives. And as a result, it cr helped create a, America's first generation gap. Young Americans wanted a very different life from the one that their parents had experienced. And just as one little example of how this worked, think about it this way. Before the Model T, before the automobile became readily available, if you wanted to go from your hometown in, you know, Podunk, Idaho, to Chicago, you could only do it in the company of other people, right? You had to be on a railroad, or maybe you do it the old-fashioned way on a, in a wagon train or something like that, right? You had to be with a whole bunch of people, and now the automobile comes along and you can do it by yourself. You can go places all by yourself or with one other person. And as a result of that, you have America's first sexual revolution. In, in the 1920s, you have the, the, uh, a, a movement for the liberation of women and their ability to choose the guys they're going to be with. And you have uh, the new, new birth control technologies also start uh, being, being talked about at this time. But you have all sorts of movement, all sorts of uh, tendencies that are pushing people, young people, in a variety of ways, particularly in their private lives, to want to pursue happiness in their own way instead of doing what their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents had always done, which had, had always been the case before then, right? So you have this huge generation gap, and in art, it's manifested in the Revolt from the Village, which is this literary movement that I mentioned. So the Revolt from the Village is a series of books for, by authors like uh, um, uh, uh, I'm Sherwood Anderson or Sinclair Lewis, who is the leader of the Revolt from the Village movement, who are writing about the frustrations of people who feel stifled by the small town lives that they live in. And the, the greatest of all of the revolt from the village novels is Main Street by Sinclair Lewis, which was published in 1920. Have any of you read Main Street? It is probably, it is, it's unfortunate because most people don't but nowadays. It's, it's, it's largely neglected nowadays and it's unfortunate because Main Street has to be the most influential and most boring book ever published since the Bible. Okay, it is dull as dirt. But the reason why is because the book is about being bored. That's what the book is about. It's about how boring and stifling and conformist life in small town America really is. How everybody is constantly up in your business about everything. And they're always gossiping and nobody has any dreams about accomplishing something meaningful in life. And the main character of the novel is, very revealingly, a woman. A woman named Carol Kennicott, who has this dream of a life of significance and, and meaning. She wants to have a, a she wants to do something with her life. And the entire novel is about how that gets gradually strangled out of her by the incessant smallness of all of her neighbors. I say it with such passion because that's really how Lewis writes it. It is incredibly bitter towards small town America. In fact, here's a let me read for you a quote from the the, from the book, there's a, a part in one of the chapters where Lewis basically explodes in a tirade about how awful small town America really is. Okay, here it is. This is, this is how Lewis describes small town America. It is an unimaginatively standardized background, a sluggishness of speech and manners, a rigid ruling of the spirit by the desire to appear respectable. It is contentment the contentment of the quiet dead who are scornful of the living for their restless walking. 
It is negation canonized as the one positive virtue. It is the prohibition of happiness. It is slavery self-taught and self-defended. It is dullness made God. A savorless people gulping tasteless food and sitting afterward coatless and thoughtless in rocking chairs prickly with inane decorations, listening to mechanical music, saying mechanical things about the excellence of Ford automobiles and viewing themselves as the greatest race in the world. As this is this is how Sinclair Lewis views small town America. Now that's a little bit of a change from Mark Twain, right? <laughs> and, and, and Lewis is certainly the most important American writer after Mark Twain. We are to this day Americans are still rewriting and rewriting Main Street. The the story of getting out of that small town. Sometimes it's told in a positive way, in a positive light, but sometimes it's still got that bitterness to it. If you ever seen that movie Revolutionary Road it came out a few years ago, that's a perfect example. It's basically just Main Street for modern tastes. So this book just knocked them dead in 1920. It was a huge deal. And in some ways, this is really the, one of the most interesting parts of this story. It's very anti-capitalist. Right? Lewis seems to have the view that free market capitalist America inevitably leads to the lowest common denominator. In Main Street and in the, the later, his later books, because he kept telling the story over and over again in his novels, May, uh, Babbitt or Aerosmith, they're all the, basically the same kind of story. He's, he basically argued that, that in America, everything is all about appealing to the lowest common denominator, and it squashes all the possibility of greatness out of people. Now, Patterson, she didn't really buy this too much. She really didn't care that much for Lewis. She recognized how important he was, and she said so in her column. But she was bothered by the way that Lewis and, friend, and his friends, people like H.L. Mencken, who was one of his best friends, were so nasty about small-town America because Patterson thought small-town America had a lot of good things about it, she, particularly what is now called bourgeois virtues. The bourgeois virtues are the ordinary virtues of you know, paying your own bills, having a modest house, taking care of your family, and enjoying, you know, enjoying hanging out with them. Enjoying a, 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 a picnic on, with your family on a weekend and not doing anything particularly important. Lewis would have scorn for that, right? And Patterson is, is say, it says in her column, you know, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, small town America can be terrible and, and conformist. She knew that. She had grown up in exactly the kind of town that Lewis is talking about. But she still defended this small town atmosphere. Lane, on the other hand, she kind of went back and forth. Because like I said, she hated the frontier towns so intensely that she wrote novels like her best novel, Old Hometown, which is really more of a sh series of short stories that are kind of Twilight Zone kind of stories with these weird twist endings set in small town America where horrible things happen to people. And one, the, one of them, the, the servant girl hangs herself in a well because she, the, the people are gossiping that she's having an affair with a married man. I mean, it's just awful stuff. Beautifully told, though. It's a great book. Uh, anyway. Anyway, so Lane was kind of a, a mixed emotions about that because then after she had seen communism in Europe, she comes back to America and she starts having second thoughts about this. And she starts saying, you know, maybe America isn't so bad. And she writes a letter, after reading this, she writes a letter to, her, to a friend about, what she, about her change of heart about a, 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 the American small town. And this friend that got this letter was named Dorothy Thompson. Thompson was a very prominent American reporter. She was the, the most important female journalist in the United States, the first American woman to lead a major news bureau. And she was thrown out of Germany in the 1930s for reporting about Adolf Hitler. The SS visited her at her, at her apartment and expelled her personally from the country. And Thompson just happened to be married to Sinclair Lewis. Rose Wilder Lane had had an affair with her in 1920 in Paris. So here's... Uh, one of these connections, fascinating connections, between the three furies of modern libertarianism and Sinclair Lewis. Lane, in fact, babysat for Sinclair Lewis and Dorothy Thompson when they went to Europe to pick up Sinclair Lewis's Nobel Prize. Right? So Main Street is a central preoccupation for, for Lane also. Now, as I said, she, Lane kind of went back and forth between first hating the small town and then later starting to romanticize it and say, you know, Actually, American small towns have some good things about them, particularly their individualism and their, their, the freedom that, they res that, that uh, the, the American system respects in every person. Now, in 1926, Ayn Rand arrives in the United States. She escapes from, from the Soviet Union, 
And she had she couldn't she couldn't stand life in in uh, the communist countries. Comes to the United States with a big dream. Her dream is she wants to go to Hollywood and make movies. So she arrives in the United States, goes to Chicago to live with some relatives briefly, and then heads out to, to Hollywood. And uh, the, the legend is, by pure coincidence, meets uh, Cecil B. DeMille sitting in his automobile on a street in, in Hollywood. And he hires her as an extra on one of his movies. And then she says, you know, I'm, I actually, I'm a writer. And, and, and he hires her as a writer on his film. Rand loved Sinclair Lewis. In fact, she appears to have read Lewis in Russia and translated, she and her mother, to earn extra money, translated some of Lewis's novels into Russian uh, to, uh, to make extra money. And she, Lewis, she adored Sinclair Lewis. And this is a, one of the clues that actually got me to write the book. In 1936, after Rand published We the Living, her semi-autobiographical novel about life in the Soviet Union, she filled out a questionnaire where she was asked who her favorite writer was. Now, if you know anything about Rand, you would immediately assume that she would answer Victor Hugo, or Alexandre Dumas, or Edmond Rostand. Or she, she loved the, friend, the great French romanticism. Her answer was Sinclair Lewis. And if you read The Fountainhead after reading Main Street, you can see the, the influence, and even more so on Atlas Shrugged, the influence of Sinclair Lewis on her writing. That sort of, the way she satirizes, particularly people on the left, with these very sort of revealing little comments that, I, that they make, and the names, the, the, she's so good at naming characters, she gets that largely from Sinclair Lewis. The, the, in fact, my theory, this is purely speculation on my part, I admit it. My theory is that Sinclair Lewis is a character in The Fountainhead. I think he's the inspiration for Stephen Mallory, the sculptor in, in The Fountainhead. Again, I can't prove this, but he was, her, he was such a disappointed idealist. I think that's part of the influence there. But the very fact that she includes real life people in The Fountainhead under different names is itself part of Lewis's influence on her. She had never done that before in anything that she wrote until The Fountainhead, and it's largely because of Lewis's influence, and in particular, a different book that Lewis wrote and published in 1935, 1935 called It Can't Happen Here. Lewis's It Can't Happen Here is this dystopian, it's sort of a dystopian science fiction novel about fascism coming to the United States. The story is about a character named Buzz Windrip, who's a senator who defeats Franklin Roosevelt for the 1936 presidential nomination and eventually, or a Democratic nomination, eventually wins the presidency, and then institutes fascism. And the main character of the book is a reporter named Doremus Jessup, who is opposed to this, and he's kind of forced into exile. And it ends on a really dark note, like, freedom does not tr triumph, and there's sort of this secret resistance going on, and all this sort of thing. Rand loved this book. She wrote Lewis a letter where she called, likened him to a god, and said that it was the greatest novel of the 20th century. And you can, again, see that influence. But the reason why she said that was because by 1935, the second of the two big influences on these three women's lives had come about, and that was the New Deal. In 1929, of course, you have the Great Depression. In 1932, Franklin Roosevelt is elected president. He becomes ino he's inaugurated on, in March of 1933 and pledges to use the same kind of power to confront the economic emergency that he would have if America were in literally invaded by a foreign foe. At that time, the economic miracle, so-called, in the world was Benito Mussolini's Italy. The, uh, ac the intellectuals of, of the United States and, and Great Britain were looking at Mussolini's Italy as this sort of miraculous triumph. And the reason why was because Mussolini had become dictator and had cut through all that nonsense about democratic deliberation. Because all you get with democratic deliberation is you get gridlock, and nothing ever gets done. And what you really need is a strong man who's going to come in and do, get things done and do things instead of just talking about things all the time. And isn't that great? That's what we need. And it's really quite remarkable when you look at the history to see how popular dictatorship really was in the United States in the early 1930s. It was very, a very popular idea. Walter Lippmann, who was another columnist on the Herald Tribune alongside uh, uh, Isabel Patterson, told Franklin Roosevelt in a personal meeting, you have no choice but to become a dictator. So there, and he was not, by any means, the only person who said this. Of course, and, and Roosevelt, 
comes very close to basically doing this. He, the, among the initial responses and in part of the, the first New Deal are programs like the Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Industrial Recovery Act, which are these massive takeovers of the American economy in the model of Italian corporatist fascism, particularly the National Industrial Recovery Act. The National Industrial, Industrial Recovery Act tried to cartelize the entire nation's economy. What it did was it said, for instance, the automobile industry shall set the terms for how many cars are made, what kind of technological improvements you're allowed to include in them, how much you're allowed to charge for them, and so forth. And those, that decision would be made by the industry, and then it would be imposed on everybody in order to cut out all that competition, because competition is a bit very wasteful, and we don't want competition. That was the economic thinking at the time. And so you had these amazing incidents like uh, Jacob Maggot, who was a, uh, a, a laundryman in the Midwest, who was arrested and put in jail for charging too little for pressing a pair of pants. You were required under the National Industrial Recovery Act to charge more than five cents to, to press a pair of pants. He charged less than five cents, so he was jailed for this. My, the, the classic example of the ridiculousness of the National Industrial Recovery Act is the Schechter poultry case. The Schechter poultry case happened when the Schechter brothers refused to follow the New York code of fair competition that was imposed by the federal government under the act. So this is the 1930s, right? So we don't have, when you want to buy chicken for dinner, you don't down, go down to the grocery store and find it in the, in, the, in the refrigerator case, right? Back then, you had to go and buy a live chicken and cut its head off and pull out its feathers and cook it, right? So you go down to the market to pick your chicken, now this is a problem, right? Let's pretend we're all 1930s New Deal economists, okay? So I'll give you all a minute to take out three quarters of your brain and throw, the, throw it away, okay? The theory is we don't want people charging low prices for things because that the low prices are very bad. We want high prices for things because when people when, when producers get a lot of money, then that's good for the economy, right? It's just total broken window fallacy thinking. But anyway, so the problem with the market for chickens is. Early in the day, everybody shows up and they pick the best chickens they can, they can find. So by the end of the day, all you got are scr scrawny chickens that nobody wants. And nobody buys the scrawny chickens, and so the farmer has to take those scrawny chickens home at the end of the day and make them into chicken salad and sell, sell it as chicken salad, right? So the solution to this problem, I am not making this up. The federal government imposes a solution to this problem, which is you have to cover up the cage and the buyer has to reach in blindly and grab whatever chicken they happen to touch, and that's the chicken that they get. They're not allowed to choose their chicken. And the Schechter brothers say, this is nonsense. We want to compete against our, our rivals. We think we're a better butcher shop than the other guys. So we're going to let people choose their chickens, and they get charged with a federal violation in a show trial that goes up to the US Supreme Court. But the, the federal prosecutor stopped. This would be the perfect way of proving the justice of the National Industrial Recovery Act. The story goes that during the oral argument at the U.S. Supreme Court, when the federal government's lawyers tried to explain this program, the audience laughed so loud that you couldn't hear it. <laughs> the Supreme Court, I'm glad to say, struck that law down as unconstitutional. So this is just one sample of what Franklin Roosevelt is doing to the country. There's the resettlement administration, which is taking farmers off of land, and moving them to other land that they can't afford. There is the, uh, it, at, on the theory that well, they need to be more productive. While at the same time, under the Agricultural Adjustment Act, we're, ta we're paying farmers not to produce stuff because we want to make, we want to increase the scarcity of products. So on one hand, you're, you're getting farmers to produce more. On the other hand, the same government is getting farmers to produce less in order to stabilize prices, right? Rose Wilder Lane gets hired, actually, as a reporter for the Saturday Evening Post to travel through the Midwest to report on the effects that the Agricultural Adjustment Act is having on the country. And Patterson you, starts really protesting against these, project, these programs in her column over and over again. The one that really stuck in her craw was the gold thing. Roosevelt ends the gold standard and confiscates gold and cancels government contracts that promise to pay people in gold. These, these so-called gold clauses said that if the government owed you money, it, you could choose whether to accept cash or gold instead. And that was a check on inflation, because if the government started inflating the currency, you could demand payment in gold, and that, that prevented the inflation, right? Now Roosevelt cancels that and says you have to accept the cash. And, and Patterson goes into paroxysms of fury on it. I love, well, I have to say, I, I, I have, as I get older, I, I admire 
Isabel Patterson more and more, because she was such an unpleasant person. <laughs> from, from all the reports, this, she's constantly being described by people who know her as acidulous. Or, uh, and one, one person said that, she was, that no rubber plant ever grew again in a room through which she had trod. So apparently she had a horrifying temper. And like I said, very endearing. Uh, from, a, from the distance of, of a half a century. Anyway, um, so meanwhile, Rand is writing these stories that she wants to make in the movies, and they're very anti-consumerist. They're, they're basically anti-capitalist. But she's seeing what's going on in the country, and it starts to awaken her to concern about what she had witnessed in the Soviet Union. It looks like the restoration of the same kind of smallness, the same kind of everybody being up in your business stuff, that the whole revolt from the village had been about. And she recognized it from the Soviet Union, where you talk about a, a village of, 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 of mediocrity and conformity and gossiping. I mean, that's fa vastly worse than Podoc, Idaho, right? So, in 1940, Wendell Wilkie runs for president against Franklin Roosevelt, who announces that, for the, that he's going to run for a third term. And Rand is in the middle, at that point, in the middle of writing The Fountainhead. She had started working, working on it. She lays it aside in order to volunteer for the Wendell Wilkie campaign, because she said that she thought it was now or never for capitalism. She thought that if Roosevelt was reelected for a third term, he would become president for life. And she was right. Uh, and it was through that that she ended up meeting Isabel Patterson. After the campaign failed, she decided that what America really needed was an intellectual movement for freedom. There really weren't any economic theorists or social theorists out there writing about how freedom worked or, or trying to defend individual liberty. And there needed to be one, so she tried to organize one, and she wrote a letter to Isabel Patterson saying, you should join this. Patterson said no, she didn't join anything. Never joined anything. But she said, you can come down to my office and we'll talk. And they, so Rand went down there and they met and became fast friends, uh, at least for a while. Uh, now, in 1943, during that time, between 1940 and 1943, they, they were visiting each other, Patterson, Rand, and Lane, um, working on their separate books. And in 1943, they published their, their three books. And I want to say briefly, what, what are really the important things? What, for one thing, the one interesting thing to note about these books is that their titles are all synonymous. Uh, the Discovery of Freedom, let me say, The Discovery of Freedom was republished in the 50s under a different title. It's called The Mainspring of Human Progress. And The Mainspring of Human Progress is synonymous with The Fountainhead, which is synonymous with The God of the Machine, because all three of these books are about what it is about the individual that creates wealth. What is it about people that makes them free and unique and irreducible to a mathematical formula, right? That's what the books are about. The God of the Machine is, is a tough book. Patterson's God of the Machine is not an easy book to read. Um, there's some brilliant passages, but there's also some tough passages. The, what's most important about it, though, is that Patterson argues that the economy is like a machine that transforms one kind of energy to another and moves energy around from place to place. And she argues this is not a metaphor. She insisted, very much, in fact, it's not a metaphor. She literally means the economy is literally an electric circuit. And meaning that it, you take energy from the form of you know, uh, food energy, and a person eats the, the food and then comes up with a, a scientific formula that, that figures out the atomic uh, energy, right? And they've transformed the food into atomic energy, right? So, so that was Patterson's argument. The, that's the most important part of that book is that the economy is like a machine. Now today, we would say, we would pro probably say it's more like a living entity. It's more like a, an ecosystem than a machine, because it's not really built, it's, it's grown. But she was really onto something here. Uh, the, the, the important point of the discovery of freedom, which is probably my favorite introduction to libertarian thinking, if, if, whenever, if anybody asks you, what, what should I, what's the first thing I should read about, uh, about libertarianism? I like the hand of discovery, even though it has some flaws to it. It has some historical inaccuracies and things that, that Lane acknowledged. But it's a beautifully written little book. The most important part there is indefeasible personal responsibility. That every person is fundamentally individual you, and inescapably individual. 
No matter how collectivist your society gets, every person is ultimately an individual and you can't stop being an individual. You can't think for another person. You can't dream for another person. You can't give your education to another person. You can't give your hopes and fears to another person. You're irreducibly individualistic. And then, of course, the Fountainhead's most important point is the difference that Rand draws, the distinction she draws, between the creative personality and the controlling personality, or what she calls the, the creator and the second hand. And that is that the creator wants to conquer nature, to make something out of the world, whereas the second hander wants to control other people. The second hander fundamentally relates to the world through other people and is primarily concerned with how other people act, behave, and think. That's their, their fundamental essence. So their books come out, and uh, Rand starts immediately working on Atlas Shrug. And as part of that, uh, she goes to visit some uh, steel mills and, and railroad executives and things like that. And on one of these trips, she takes a, a time out to go meet Rose Wilderling in person. It's the first and only time that they met. Now, we don't really know what happened at that meeting, because the only record we have of it comes from about 15 years after the fact, when Rose Wilder Lane wrote a letter describing what happened. And she claimed that they argued about religion and never spoke again, and that Rand didn't understand the first thing about individualism. But it turns out that actually, the day after their meeting, Lane wrote this very nice letter to Rand saying, I loved our visit. I sure hope you come back, and next time I'll make rhubarb pie which uh, she, she likes to make pie. Uh, that, one of my, probably my favorite little tidbit is the letter which, that she wrote to Rand where she said, P.S., have you ever read my mother's books? And I just, the idea of Ayn Rand reading Little House on the Prairie, I find just, it just tickles me to no end. Uh, there's no evidence that Rand ever read uh, Little House on the Prairie. Anyway, uh, so what probably happened is that they probably did disagree about religion, but, Religion doesn't actually seem to have been the reason for their falling out. Actually, Lane just got too busy, and Rand got too busy. She started working on the movie version of The Fountainhead, and very shortly after that, she's working on Atlas Shrugged, and she starts developing with this group of followers. She starts writing her newsletter. She's just too tied up with other things, and she, of course, is far more famous than either of the other two, and becomes a major media figure. Whereas Patterson and Lane kind of disappear gradually, especially Patterson. Patterson was always kind of a depressive, and in 1949, a close friend of hers committed suicide. And that probably worsened things a lot. Plus, the owner of the newspaper died and was replaced by a far, uh, uh, somebody whose political views are far to the left. And Patterson was basically forced out of working for the Herald Tribune and forced into retirement. She spent the rest of her life working on a novel that she never really finished, uh, that's never been published, uh, and writing occasional articles for National Review and stuff. But she, her falling out with Rand came about because just before all of this happened, she was hoping to start up a, a free market magazine, and Rand tried to, to introduce her to some wealthy people who might be able to fund this magazine. And so Patterson comes out to, to Los Angeles to meet with them and proceeds to offend all of them so horribly <laughs> that Rand finally couldn't take it anymore. On one occasion, they had a dinner with the actress Janet Gaynor and her husband Adrian, a very famous uh, Hollywood costume designer uh, William Mullendore, the owner of, or the president of Southern California Edison. Of, these are very wealthy and influential people. And Patterson gets so angry at the at the fact that businessmen refuse to stand up for their rights that she insults them all to their faces to the point where at one meeting Mullendore just stormed out, and at another Gaynor said to Rand on her way out of the, uh, out the door, she said, "That woman needs to be locked up and brought out only on special occasions." So, uh, at the end, Patterson's personality problems were really, Rand couldn't take that anymore. They, they still corresponded, but their friendship came to an end after that. So, it, you, you kind of want it to be sort of a salacious story about ideological disagreements. It actually turns out that it really wasn't that. But, one of the interesting tidbits I'll leave you with is that after you read the history of the period, of the New Deal particularly, you find out how much of what really, of what happens in the, in Atlas Shrugged particularly, really did happen in the United States during the New Deal. You read the, the story, this stuff and it's like Rand's dystopian uh, novel predicting the future. It's not predicting. She's describing things that actually happened in this country. 
uh, just to give one example, there's a passage in How the Shrug where the steel tycoon Hank Reardon is forced to sign over his rights to the, the miraculous Reardon medal that he's invented. And the government official insists that he personally sign the document in order to concede the legitimacy of the seizure. That actually happened in real life, but it happened to, to uh, Henry Ford, who opposed the National Industrial Recovery Act. He actually was complying with all of the act's requirements in substance, but he refused to sign the certificate that said that he was in compliance with the act because he was opposed to the act. So Franklin Roosevelt held a, a press conference announcing that the federal government would be canceling all of its contracts with Ford automobiles until Henry Ford himself personally signed the document conceding the legitimacy of the National Industrial Recovery Act. Now, amazingly enough, Roosevelt was forced to back down in that, in that confrontation because the government just needed Ford automobiles that much. But it's a, a good example of how a lot of the stuff that you read in Atlas Shrugged that seemed like it's sort of you know, out of Rand's mind actually did happen in the, in the real world. Anyhow, that's my spiel for you. I hope you all check out my book. It's, it was a lot of fun to write and to learn in part about how close this country really came to dictatorship in the 1930s and 40s. It's really, it's an untold story. You know, it's, it's fashionable nowadays to talk, and now to talk about uh, uh, erased history. You talk about erased history, what actually happened in this country during the New Deal is the erased history in this country. It has been consciously concealed by a history profession that is more loyalty, loyal to the spirit of Franklin Roosevelt than it is to the truth. And it's really a disgrace. I'm glad to say the economists are not so uh, blinded by the lingering rays of his glory, but the, the history profession still is. So anyway, I hope, that, uh, hope you'll check it out and happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm going to get uh, yeah, Mike and bring it around. Oh, yeah. Um, I, um, well, yeah, but the recording is the mic. So you'll use the mic. That's right. <laughs> President. For life. Same diff. <laughs> Alright, so why did a brand rise to prominence so much more than the other? Was it like timing or was it just more elegant presentation? Why did Rand become more prominent than the others? I do think timing was a large part of it. I think that because she was younger and because television really blew up later on in life and because uh, of other factors like that. I think Rand just happened to be, in, in some respects, happened to be at the right age at the right time that she could spread her ideas, right, with, with interviews like on, on The Tonight Show and stuff like that, which Lane, Lane died in 1968 and Patterson died in 1961, so it was too late for them to do that. Um, but also part of it is she was honestly a better writer. Um, all three of them were novelists. All three of them wrote semi-autobiographical novels. Almost all of Patterson's novels are semi-autobiographical. There's a lot of, of autobiographical stuff in Lane's novels, and of course, Rand with We the Living. And Rand, she, you, can, you see that she's, she's writing in the tradition of people like Victor Hugo. These marvelous, giant, larger-than-life characters and these big dramatic plots. But she also was writing in the spirit of Hollywood. She knew a good cinematic moment when she saw one. And her novels are written with an eye to Hollywood. Um, for example, the, the, uh, what's a Wyatt's torch in Atlas Shrug, the explosion of the oil well. It, that, what a cinematic moment in that novel, right? And that's something that Patterson would never put in her novels. Her novels are these sort of rambling, introspective, uh, stream of consciousness, not quite, but almost stream of consciousness kind of novels with almost no plot. Which they liked in the 40s, but it, it's kind of died away. Now, Lane actually, of course, of the three, if you really want to say who has had the biggest cultural impact, it's Lane. But it's just people don't know it. And the reason is because of Little House on the Prairie, and particularly the TV show. Uh, which has influenced people. They have no idea who Rose Wilder Lane is. But if Lane, you know, she, one of the things she did, she tended to adopt people. She adopted a half dozen young people during her life. And by adopt, I mean not legally, I don't think, but she, uh, financially and, and emotionally. And when, uh, in uh, 1943, after the, God, after the Discovery of Freedom came out, she adopted a, a guy um, whose name is Roger Lee McBride, a 14-year-old boy named Roger Lee McBride, whose father was an editor for uh, Reader's Digest magazine. And 
Uh, he became her, basically her grandchild, more or less. He became her executor, the executor of her estate, and uh, was the first person to run for president on the Libertarian Party ticket, and became the executive producer of the Little House on the Prairie television series. So he, uh, here's an even greater influence of Rose Madeleine on the public that people don't know about, Trader Joe's. So one of the projects that Lane worked on uh, when she was young was she did some ghost writing to bring in extra money. There was a travel writer named Lowell Thomas who wrote books about his travels around the world, and one of his books was called uh, uh, White Shadows in Dark Seas, I think it was. And it's about, uh, it's about South, the South Pacific, about Polynesia. And Patterson, or Lane, rather, ghost wrote this book. In fact, when he didn't pay her, she ended up suing him for this. Well, that book was made into a movie, which was hugely successful. In fact, I believe it won an Oscar. And that movie, White Shadows in, in, in Black, Dark Seas, or whatever it is, uh, was the movie that inspired the, 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 the store, Trader Joe's. So, now, little did you know that libertarian intellectuals are responsible for Trader Joe's. <laughs> Okay, I have a question, um, a textual question about the fountainhead. Um, based on what you said about how it's ultimately about there are, you know, two, it's, it's, in fact, a lot of Ayn Rand's books are Manichaean in this way. And the fountainhead is there are the creative people who conquer nature, and there are the second handers who live through and want to conquer men. Yeah. What do you think of um, Howard Rourke at the end of the novel destroying his edifice and Gail Winand as a, as a character, because frankly, and I've taken some flack for this, for writing about this, but um, like I see those as destructive acts that are lashing out at people who had hurt them, and yes, bad people, but it's no longer creating for creation's sake, and it's no longer what, what Rourke said to um, Tui when Tui asked him, oh, you know, after all of this, what do you think of me? But I don't think of you. Not because he hasn't you know, caused uh, Rourke a lot of harm, but because Rourke is just such a magnanimous doer and creator that he's not going to let the world and all its evil stuff stop him. And it, it's, he, he was kind of like stoic up, to, up until that point. And uh, I frankly don't like how, how it ends, and I think it makes him look a lot like Wyman, who's supposed to be his corrupted foil. So anyway, I, I want your literary take on that. The Fountainhead has a lot more layers to it than people give it credit for, and a lot more layers to it than Alex Shrug does. Um, my theory, and again, it's pure speculation on my part, but my theory is that Rand originally intended the book to be about Gail Wyman. Uh, if you look at her writings before that, she never tries to create a character like Howard Rourke before the Fountainhead. None of her, even her draft stories, even her outlines, don't really try to create a Howard Rourke-like character. He's the first one that comes along. Um, and the, the novel actually devotes a great deal more time to Gail Wyman than it does to, to, how, to how her work. And the book is really the tragedy of Gail Wyman's life. And now Wyman is very heavily based on the real life William Randolph Hearst, very closely based on, on William Randolph Hearst, who was a very controversial figure at that time, in part because he had started out as a Franklin Roosevelt supporter and then turned and became a, one of Roosevelt's principal opponents. In 1933, uh, in March of 1933, he, uh, 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 William Randolph Hearst, paid for the production of a movie called Gabriel Over the White House, which portrays the president being instructed by God himself to impose a dictatorship to end all world hunger and, and destroy all war and to kill all of his political enemies and usher in a reign of peace. Because that was, Hearst was basically a fascist, and that's why he was pro-Roosevelt in 1932 and 33. Then Roosevelt started curtailing his business, and he didn't like that. He was like, well, it's fine to control other people, but don't you come around here and start restricting my business. And he turned against Roosevelt and opposed him, and there was a showdown between the two of them. And that was really, I think, the, the inspiration Rand wanted to focus on why, why this had happened to, to somebody who really was a great industrial tycoon, but then sold his soul out to the, to the lowest common denominator, that, that uh, Main Street kind of story. And she got stuck on the novel at one point in the late 30s. And she couldn't figure out how to end it. And then the story is that she got the idea in a flash of inspiration. Now, I would very much like the story to be as follows, but it is not. 
I would very much like the story to be that she had conversations with Isabel Patterson, and Patterson told her the story about Guts and Borlam destroying the, mon the, the model for uh, Grant, the Stone Mountain in Georgia. Mm -hmm. But that can't be the case, because they didn't meet until two years later, so it can't be that. But, in 1938, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City held an exhibition to display the, a brand new house that had just been designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who had, was, you know, Wright is a, is a curious character. Of all the characters in the Founded that are based on real life people, Rourke least resembles his real life model of, of Frank Lloyd Wright. One thing people tend to forget is how old Frank Lloyd Wright really was. Wright was born in 1867. He was born shortly after the Civil War, and he died in 1959. So he lived for almost a century. He, he was born in the age of steam and died in the space age. And when you look at Franklin Wright's buildings, you think this is like this, this space age futuristic guy. And really, he was a Victorian character. He was 40 years old when the automobile appeared, right? So what happened was Wright was basically forgotten by the architectural profession by the 1930s, which had moved on to other styles. And then the Johnson Wax Building and Fallen Water came out in 1937, 1938. And they were displayed at the Museum of Modern Art. And Rand went to see this display, which was held, by the way, at Rockefeller Center, which was also newly finished. And I think that's what it was. It was like, this is the spark of greatness that is the antithesis of Gail Wynand. Uh, I'll also add that the relationship between Wynand and Rourke owes a lot, I think, to the friendship between Patterson and Rand. There's a lot of where Wynand is like, he's older than Rourke, significantly older, just like Patterson, and he's sort of dark and cynical, but when he looks at Rourke, he sees something about him that reminds him of what it was like to be young and idealistic. And that's very much how Rand and Patterson relate. Patterson was dark and cynical, but when she saw Rand, it kind of it sparked this romanticism in her. So I think there's that. Um, beyond that, though, I, I think I would hesitate to, to, to go. I don't think, I do think that the, the climax of the Fountainhead works really well. I don't think Rourke is wrong in destroying the, his creation. Uh, incidentally, Wynand, in the novel, Wynand divorces Dominique, who marries Howard Rourke. And Wynum just goes off into obscurity. In the movie, divorce was too controversial to discuss on screen, so Wynum shoots himself instead. Because apparently killing yourself was OK, but getting a divorce, ah, can't have that on the, on the big screen, right? That's Hollywood, then and now. Anyway. Any, we're taking questions. You mentioned a crossover between Ford and Rudin in uh, Shrub. Are there any other um, friendly correlations of real life and fictional characters to note, such as with Daphne or Francisco, et cetera? Yeah, so um, I sort of suspect that a little bit of Dagny is Isabel Patterson. Mm -hmm. The fact that she works for a railroad. Isabel Patterson had worked as a secretary for railroad magnate R.B. Bennett in Canada when she was young, as his personal secretary. Bennett went on to become prime minister of Canada, in fact. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that. And Patterson knew, knew a lot of railroad um, uh, magnates as a result of that and helped introduce Rand to a lot of them and, and got her a lot of books on the history of railroads and things when she was working on Atlas Shrugged. The, the Probably my favorite example, though, of a real life, well, there's two. I'll give you two. My favorite examples of real life characters in Atlas Shrugged. The first one is Hank Reardon, who is based on the owner of Republic Steel, a guy named Tom Girdler, who in 1943 published his memoirs. Now, in, uh, in 1938, 38? It was 38. In 1938, there was a, the, uh, uh, an attempt to unionize. The, the little steel factories in the country, little steel is, is what the term used for it, because US steel and the other major steel suppliers in the country had already been unionized. So the, frankly, communist steel workers organizing committee decided to take over the smaller scale steel uh, 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 foundries also. So they, uh, but Republic Steel already had a union. Now, Swak said, it's not a real union, it's a company union, because it doesn't represent the true interests of the workers. But the workers were fine with, with the existing union. So Swak held protests at Republic Steel's plants. 
And at one pro protest on Memorial Day in 1938 in Chicago, the protesters started throwing rocks and the cops shot back and 10 people were killed and it's known as the Memorial Day Massacre. And Girdler, the president of the company, got a lot of the blame for it, even though he wasn't there and it was the cops who were shooting, not his guards or anything like that, but he, he got trounced in the, in the news about this. So he wrote his memoir, Bootstraps, 1943, sort of to refute this, to defend himself. Patterson got an advanced copy of it because she's a book reviewer. And she reads it and she immediately sends it to Ayn Rand. And she says, you got to look at this. This, this is a character for your, for your novel. And Rand reads it and writes a letter to Girdler, directly to Girdler. And she says, you don't understand. You say in your book that you're as good as any philanthropist, but you are much better. And the real reason why you were being attacked is because of altruism. And she goes into her whole thing about altruism and, and selfishness and all this sort of stuff. And then she ends, you have to read The Fountainhead and the God of the Machine. And apparently Girdler did, because Pat Rand later reported to Patterson that they had talked, that she had met Girdler in person, and he had read them. And in fact, he sent her a signed copy of his memoirs. Well, the reason he gets turned into Hank Reardon is because what, in fact, Patterson said this in her column, Girdler, she said that the, what was the most remarkable thing about the book was, his, was the, the contrast between his great technical wisdom and his complete ignorance of philosophy. That he knew nothing about why people do things. He didn't understand politics or, or anything like that. And she says it right there in her column. And Rand was of the same view. And so the naive businessman who doesn't understand why he's being hated by a society that penalizes greatness is that, that character. That's, that's where that comes from. Never, Rand was never photographic. She wasn't like Sinclair Lewis. Sinclair Lewis was trying to literally re represent that person in reality. Rand always stylized her characters to draw out their philosophical essences. But Girdler is the basis of, Han of Hank Girdler. The other fa favorite example of a real life person in that show is Isabel Patterson herself, who is in the, the, uh, in the scene where we first hear the term Atlantis. So Patterson loved the legend of Atlantis, and she mentions it often in her books and in her column. She had this theory that there actually was such a thing as a lost land of, of Atlantis, and that it was North America, and maybe the Vikings had found it or something. But in one of her columns, she was reviewing a book about life in the American West. And of course, she had grown up in the American West. She had literally witnessed Indian ceremonies on the Western Plains. And so here's a book about that. And she says, in, at, at one point in the, in the review, she says, the American West was a lost Atlantis. It was a place where you could, where anything was possible. She, you know, she said, in, in, she said when, the, when the Wright brothers invented the airplane, she said nobody made a big deal about it at the time because in America, anybody could do anything. Of course you could fly, which actually is true. Nobody did make a big deal about it when the Wright brothers first flew. Anyway, so she had this, she used Atlantis repeatedly in her novels too to represent the America she had known before the New Deal, a land of opportunity and freedom and big characters like Guts and Borglum and stuff like that, and pass that on to Rand. So that the first time the word Atlantis is used in that, the shrug, is at a cocktail party when a woman, an unnamed woman, just comes up to Dagny and says, I know who is John Galt. He discovered Atlantis. There really was such a place as Atlantis. And I knew somebody who actually went to Atlantis. And Dagny's like, uh, OK. And the woman gets really mad that she doesn't believe her and storms away angrily in the novel. Well, that is Isabel Patterson. We know that's Isabel Patterson because while Rand was writing out a shrug, she wrote a letter to Rose Wilder Lane saying, have you noticed how Isabel is getting more and more angry all the time? And Lane writes back, now we don't have the full letter. We only have one page of this letter that Lane wrote back to Rand. But in that page, she says, yes. She says she's getting worse. She says, a while back, she says she was visiting me at my house in Connecticut. And she was sitting on, we were, we were sitting on the patio out back, and we were talking about whether it's possible for rose bushes to grow in shade underneath trees. And Isabel was saying, rose bushes can't grow in shade. And she says, we were sitting five feet away from my rose bush, which has been growing in the shade of a maple for 20 years. And I pointed it out to Isabel, and she said, I still say rose bushes can't grow in shade. And that stubbornness was really part of Patterson. So when, when the character in Atlas Shrugged gets angry that Dagny doesn't believe it, that's totally Isabel Patterson. So she, Rand, of course, included herself in Atlas Shrugged in, in, a, in a little cameo. She also put Patterson in the novel, and that's been, unfortunately, overlooked by a lot of people. Other questions, or? Well, it is a terrible death to be talked to death.
But as a lawyer, I can go all night. So. All right. Oh, wait, 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 I got one. Um, you were talking a lot about the, uh, I'm ready to play, um, about the political context in which uh, it, that Ayn Rand's almost allegorical in her description of the political or ec uh, economic takeover by Franklin Roosevelt um, and his and the New Deal. So I'm wondering what other, if there are other like historical allegories that she put into her work, like um, especially since America in the 30s, there's Huey Long, like was the first yeah. person who I thought of when you mentioned the predilection for dictatorship. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if there were other elements like uh, that she incorporated that were historical allegory. Yeah, I'll give you another one is artistic, right? The art of the of the 30s is turning much more, much it's turning away from the romanticism and individualism of the turn of turn of the century art. I mean, they were talking about painting, sculpture, music, whatever it is. Away from the music of Rachmaninoff, who of course is the basis of Richard Halley in, in Alice Shrugged, and toward sort of the atonal kind of styles of, of modernism. Away from the paintings of, you know, what, the, the, like John Singer Sargent, in, who, who dies in what, 1925, and toward, you know, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe or Grandma Moses or the, the uh, Kandinsky and stuff like that. So those make a showing in Atlas Shrug. And there's actually a plan uh, that's offered by a writer named James M. Kane. He proposes in the, in the late 40s, he proposes that the government should force the, the, all the writers basically into a union. What, what would happen is that the, the writers would be forced to hand over their copyrights to a government entity, which would then parcel out the, the, the earnings equally to all the, all the writers in the country, which is made into, Balf Eubank, the writer in, in Atlas Shrug, it defends this proposal in one passage in Atlas Shrug. So there are other elements, other intellectual elements that are going on at the time. Um, of course, it's well known that um, the character of Robert Stadler, the scientist, is based on uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the inventor of the atomic bomb. Rand was actually hired to write a movie about the making of the atomic bomb, which never got made. And as part of the, her work, she interviewed Oppenheimer and other scientists at the Manhattan Project. And the impression she got of Oppenheimer was that he too was philosophically, philosophically naive and but had a predilection for sort of mysticism and things that left him vulnerable to having his inventions twisted in terrible ways. And she then, when, when, although the movie got canceled, she kind of turned around and used that to make Robert Stadler. So you also see the scientific and technological changes of the time. Uh, Reared in metal is more or less titanium and aluminum. Uh, there's, there's lots of little parallels that go on into inspiring. It's really quite remarkable how this stuff didn't just come out of her own head, although you know, she and her followers sometimes say, say things that make it sound that way. I think it's actually more interesting that it's not. I think it's kind of cool that she was able to take real life things and kind of draw out their philosophical, philosophical essences and then use them in her real novel, which is uh, something that she would have gotten from people like Victor Hugo and Sinclair Lewis both. Right? Uh, the, her novel, Atlas, is really this really unusual blend of Sinclair Lewis's naturalism and Victor Hugo's romanticism, which is one reason why, one of the many reasons, why people hated it when it came out, critics hated it when it came out. By that time, critics had come to loathe romanticism. They embraced the, the, the sort of dismal naturalist style of people like, like Steinbeck and Richard Wright. And, uh, and so when Atlas came out, they didn't know what to make of it. They had, nobody had read, nobody had written novels like that for a century by that point, almost. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I really appreciate you, you. coming out.